Southwest Health Equity Research Collaborative. And then I was also, I'm also part of the Native American Cancer Prevention Partnership. And so that's the logo that's up there with the hands. And, and so between all of these different partnerships or centers, uh, it's really driven how my research is going now at NAU. And so I've been here, there for almost four years. And before then, I was at UNM. And I'll talk a little bit about how I got here to Arizona, because I am actually um, from uh, Western New York, so I'm Onotawaka. But before I get started, I was trying to see if there was a land acknowledgement for, for the school here, but I couldn't find one, so I just used NAU since we're not too far away. Um, but again, just acknowledging that these are the homelands of many indigenous populations, and we want to honor the past, the present, and the future generations. All right, so this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. How did I go from the res, or the reservation, uh, in western New York, and how did I get up, uh, get to here in Flagstaff? And some of the hurdles and some of the, the obstacles I faced, as well as some of the, um, uh, I guess you could say, the improvements I've made as a self uh, over the years. And so, as I mentioned, I am Onotowaka or Seneca, and it all started for me with family. And you can all define family however you want. Uh, family for me, again, is my blood relatives, but also my best friend, um, other f uh, cousins, distant cousins, aunties, as we call them sometimes in Native communities. And so this is just some of my family um, that has supported me as a young person and now as a as an assistant professor. And so growing up on the reservation, this is just a little bit about our background. So we are, are from Haudenosaunee, which means long house, people of the longhouse, right? And so this is an example of one of our longhouses. It's actually standing at one of the museums located in Western New York right now. And Onotowaka is one of the five original tribes that make up the Iroquois Confederacy. And so these are, again, what some of our traditional dancers look like uh, right now. And so uh, Onotowaka means keepers of the western door. So we are the western tribe of the Haudenosaunee. Uh, and so we really were a warrior tribe. And that's the reservation that I grew up that circled there in red. So these are some of the, the standing reservations. But our, our land actually went up into Canada and then down into Pennsylvania. And so again, we're a much smaller community. Right now we're about 10,000 um, enrolled and about half of those tribal members live on one of the different reservations and then the rest are either off the reservation or like myself um, in different parts of the country or world. And so as a native person and growing up on the reservation, I really wasn't exposed to STEM fields. Um, even though Buffalo, New York, wasn't too far away, we really didn't venture away from the reservation that much. And so I am a first generation college student. Um, my mother eventually went to college um, later in her years. Um, but, you know, as a first generation, I had my sister who went to college before me, and then it was myself, and then my brother went after me. Um, and so, but living on the reservation, we were constantly bullied, either on or off the reservation. Um, I think it was in that era where people weren't as accepting as they are now. And so, seeing a Native person off the reservation was sometimes daunting. I, gr I, went, I worked at a grocery store off the reservation, and people were like, where are you from? And I was like, what? I was like, I'm from the res. <laughs> and they, they just didn't understand that Native Americans actually still lived and resided in New York, and we had reservations. So um, it, was, it was a little challenging as a child. And so um, as a first generation coming from poverty, we grew up on government commodities. And so a lot of times we would have uh, different meals made from these examples right here. So dried milk was a, our most common source of milk. We had canned meats, uh, other things like that. 
This was our health facility uh, when I grew up, and this is actually what it looks like now, or one of them, actually. Uh, and so they've actually uh, grown as a community since I was a child. But as a child, uh, I actually had to deal with a lot of different family illnesses. And so my family members suffered from diabetes, um, heart disease, you know, a lot of things that are seen in native populations or underserved populations. We also had cancer and rare neurological disorders um, and arthritis. And those are just to name uh, a few of them. And so moving away from the reservation and going to college was intimidating, not only be as a first generation, but just being off the reservation and in a uh, private university. So I went to Rochester Institute of Technology. And there, there's about, when I was there, was about 25,000 students. Um, only about five were active and native individuals. And so again, I, I felt secluded while I was there at RIT. Um, however, uh, as I mentioned in, in, a, in the next slide, I was introduced to the American Indian Science and Engineering Society, which I'm actively involved with. And this was all through um, a my mentors. And so when I was an undergrad, I met my first native who had a PhD. And so this is Dr. Jason Yonker right now. He's actually from Oregon, and he's now works for the University of Oregon, and he's the, um, the, the tribe uh, president for his community. And so he really took me under his wing as well as others um, at the university, and they made me feel like I belonged there, and that was really important as a, a young student. And so as a, in high school, I really didn't struggle with grades. You know, I was, I was easy to get high grades, but then when I went to undergrad, I completely cut my GPA right in half. Um, and I also had to take out student loans as a first generation um, at a private institution. And so those were hurdles that I, even now as I work with high school students, I have to help them get through, like understanding what student loans are, um, filling out the FAFSA, if any of you have had to do that recently, it's still, just as annoying as it was when I was a, as an undergrad. <laughs> um, but then I was going, because my parents were ill, I was going home quite frequently. So even though I was only two hours away, I didn't have a vehicle. So trying to bus home or find ways to get home um, was difficult. And so my mother, at that time, she was diagnosed my first semester with breast cancer for the second time. The first time was actually in high school. And my father's neurological disorder was causing him to go blind, so he had a hard time helping my mother. So again, my sister and my brother and I, we helped a lot in, in taking care of my, my parents. Um, and so really all of that combined with the fact that I was away from home, really um, I had a lot of issues with self-identity, right? So I struggled with who I was as a person, who I was culturally, um, I didn't realize that I was different from individuals until people actually started to mention it or bring it up. And so I really struggled with that in my, my early years as an as a undergrad. But J Dr. Jason Yonker and others were very supportive. They understood what I was going through, and they encouraged me to stick with not only school, but STEM itself. And so because of them, uh, I was able to go on and pursue a PhD in chemistry. And so I actually went just down the road. It was literally maybe a couple miles to Rot or University of Rochester, where I have my bachelor's and PhD in chemistry. And so I interviewed at some other institutions, but they were away from home. So being even farther away was a little bit scary back then. Um, and so I decided that Rochester was close to home and I felt comfortable, and so I wanted to stay uh, in the area as well. And so this logo is the logo for my first patch, which uh, is in the Army National Guard, which I'll talk to uh, in a couple of slides. So as a graduate student, you know, I still faced a lot of uh, obstacles. And so my parents, their diseases were getting worse. I lost my only surviving uh, grandparent to Alzheimer's disease. It was rapidly progressing Alzheimer's disease. And within that same year, uh, I lost both my parents. So I lost three of the most significant individuals all in 2009 
to various different diseases. And so during this time, I still struggled as a new graduate student, not understanding really what a PhD was, what was expected of me. I had a new advisor as well, and we had different personalities. He also didn't quite understand the cultural responsibility uh, that I had to going home. And so I really, really just struggled as in my early years. And so I decided to take a leave of absence. And so right after I finished my master's qualifications, I took some time off and I went home. And that was really just to take a break and figure out what I wanted to do with my life. So I joined the military, because that's what every logical decision is to do, right? Is to take time off and join the military. So I say that's not for everybody, but it worked for me. Um, and so before I went to boot camp, I worked at the local grocery store. I was helping my parents, this was before they passed. Um, and then I joined the Army National Guard. I had a friend that was also in the Army National Guard. And so he was like, why don't you come over? They'll feed you, they'll pay you, they'll clothe you. I was like, sure, sounds great. Um, and so I joined the Guard in, in 2009. And since then, I've had many different um, uh, assignments. So I started as a logistics officer in New York. And you can see me being very responsible up there, hanging on one of the helicopters. Um, and then this is more recently, I, when I was in New Mexico, I was uh, the senior training and advising officer or TAC officer, which is a fancy way to say a drill sergeant for those that want to be officers. So I don't know if we have any current or former military uh, in, the, in the audience. I decided to then switch to military police. So when I joined the Army, women were not allowed to be in combat arms. Um, and so I'm not the type that likes to be told what I can't do. Uh, <laughs> and so uh, when I got a little bit older, I was like, all right, well, I'm a little too old for, for combat arms, but let me join the military police. And so I, I've been a military police officer. I was activated during the rioting that we had um, a couple years ago. And I've also been on uh, different uh, tours uh, within the states as well. But recently, uh, in October 2020, I was recruited to the Army Reserves. And so there, I have been uh, down to Palau for two different occasions. So Palau is a Pacific Island country, which is near the Philippines. And there, uh, I've been working with some of their leadership to help build STEM and biomedical capacity within uh, the Palauan uh, community. And so Palau is a, is a COFA, so Compact of Free Association country under the United States. Uh, and so this is me with Dr. Kidalong. He's the only Palauan PhD. There are about 20,000 individuals. And when I go to Palau, I feel like it's the res, but tropical. Like I'm like, this feels like home, but tropical. Um, and so we've uh, been able to really do a lot of cultural immersion uh, between our two communities. This is Bilung, who is their queen. Um, and so here I met with, I've met with her on different occasions to talk about uh, what it's like to be a native individual and some of the health disparities that we are facing right now. And so for, for those in the audience, uh, especially students, um, I, I want to challenge you to some of these acronyms. So leadership, right, is the, acro is the seven army ethos, right? So loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And so as a, a student, um, where does your loyalty lie? Does, it loy does your loyalty lie with your family, with your friends, with here, with your university? Where does your loyalty lie? And then duty, right? What is your job as a student? What are you supposed to be doing? Maybe you're a non-traditional student, um, and so you have multiple duties that you're responsible for. And then respect, right? And so this is something that I think I had to learn, not only to respect others, but to respect myself um, and to gain that sort of identity back um, through respect for myself. And so again, as students here, who, who do you respect? Do you respect yourself? Do you respect your elders? Um, wh where does your respect uh, lie here? And then selfless service, right? So again, for, for first generation students, right? Selfless service uh, could mean many different things. It could be mean, meaning uh, giving back to your community, 
um, or it could be any other type of on-campus type of service that you do, right? So what, what does this mean to you? And then honor, right? Honor, I felt like joining the military was not just for me to have something to do with my life and to get some guidance, but was to honor my parents, right? To, to get me on the right path to, to help honor them. And that's really what I, I do now is try to honor my parents, honor my community, my, my community as in tribal community, um, and then also my scientific community as well. Um, integrity, right? Can you do the right thing without people having to acknowledge you or watch you uh, do the right thing? And then personal courage, again, um, school can be scary, especially for first generations or going um, into graduate programs. I don't know what you plan on doing all after you, you finish here, but right, but putting yourself out there and being willing to be courageous and take those next steps, right? And so again, I just challenge all of you to, to think about these seven army ethos and how that they apply to you in your life now. Um, and so I was out of school for approximately two years and then um, after I finished the basic training and the officer candidate school, I went back and completed my, my PhD program. But things weren't easy. Like I said, I lost both my parents uh, during this time. I now had military obligations. And so I was really trying to struggle and balance some of those things. But again, I had great mentors. And during that time, I met Dr. Cliff Poudry, who worked uh, at the National Institutes of Health at the time, and he was also Seneca. And so he introduced me, which would then be my, my future postdoc, which I'll talk about. So eventually I did graduate with my PhD, and so this is my brother and my little nephews right here um, at my graduation. And so while on paper everything looks pretty linear, believe me, it was not. I was like all over the place. Um, trying to get to to the end road of that PhD. So with that, I you know I want to say, don't let your grades define you, right? And so as a bad student, one of these students maybe that has a low GPA, right? These are things that were actually said about me um, when I was a, considered a bad student, right? I was unmotivated. I wasn't willing to improve my grades. I lacked discipline. Um, I had a a teacher or uh, say to me, biochemistry is hard. I'm not sure if you're going to make it. Right, look at me now. But anyway, um, and so then I also had a colleague say, I guess it's not what you know, but who you know, right? Because I was able to, to advance my career and get a postdoc. And so those were really discouraging words. Um, but it wasn't until, right, that I became a good student. And I really don't like to let GPA define students, especially those coming into my lab, because I have been that bad student in the past. And I really look at the individual and what they're going to do and what their motivations are, right? And so these are, again, some things that uh, have been said about me now as a good student. And so since then, right, I became the 2018 um, Professional of the Year through the American Indian Science and Engineering Society. And actually, my my uh, alma mater, the University of Rochester, has me as one of their visionary women of Rochester, which is with some of the, the leading women um, in the country and in STEM and also other areas as well. And so, you know, again, don't let those grades define you. I try to tell my current students, you know, if you're having a bad semester or whatever, right, it's fine. You, you can get over that. It's just keeping your head up and, and pushing forward. And so my, my mentors, uh, like I said, Dr. Poudry and others, encouraged me to pursue a postdoc. Again, I really didn't know what that was, why we did postdocs. And so I went to the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, which is under the National Institutes of Health in Bethesda, Maryland. And there, again, I did some really great research, but I think some of the best outcomes that I had as a, as a postdoc was building my network, right? And so not just with other native individuals, native professionals, but also with non-natives and getting to, to work with some of the top researchers at the NIH. Um, but then I also really got to decide what I wanted to do. 
And this was the one of the first times where I wasn't just that token native and one of a handful, but at the NIH, they were really trying to build their, their native representation as in their summer program. And so while I was at the NIH, I formed the Native Scholars Program with some of the, there's two other postdocs there. Um, there's three when I was at the NIH, that's the most they ever had at one time. And that's three natives out of approximately 4,000 uh, postdocs across the NIH campus. So that tells you how, how rare it is for us to get to that type of level. Um, I also was, because of these summer programs, I was able to be introduced to th this younger generation. And they were my motivation for why I went into academia, right? Being able to encourage them to pursue STEM or these others' careers, and then having somebody to look up to. And so these are pictures of some of the students. They look so young now because now I know a lot of them have graduated and gone on and done some great things. This is Skyler right here. Um, he's actually just finishing his Master's of Public Health at NAU. He worked with me. Um, so just to see some of these faces now, I'm, I gotta update these photos, I think. Um, this is myself with some of my high school students, uh, Dr. Rita Devine and Dr. Anjo de la Cruz um, at one of the local conferences as well. And then here I'm, I'm standing up here with some tribal leaders and the former NIH director Dr. Francis Collin and the, the co-director, which would be Dr. Tabak as well. And so here we're able to really drive um, native health. And so since our initiative and our push, they now have the Tribal Health Research Office at the NIH. And so this is one of the big things that myself and other and the other postdocs were really pushing for while we were there. And so I went from the NIH and I actually did a second postdoc. And this was, physically I was located at the University of New Mexico. This was scary too because it was the first time being really far away from home, but I wasn't too scary because my sister lived in, it lives in White Rock. So she's married um, and her husband works at Los Alamos National Labs. So again, I felt pretty comfortable, even as a postdoc though I was a little scared to move far away from home. Um, I also did a, more of a virtual training through the Centers for American Indian and Alaska Native Health. This is really where I started to get introduced to public health and working with tribal communities was through this program. So I was in both of these programs while I was in New Mexico um, and, and learning more about vaccines as well when I was in, in New Mexico. So that's really what my research focuses on now. And then I went to a conference, uh, I think in my near my second, uh, end of my second year um, as a postdoc. And that's where I met Dr. Jenny Ingram, who is a colleague now at NAU. And she really recruited me to come to NAU. When I was looking for faculty positions, I was looking at all those big research institutions. I was interviewing there. And you know, NAU is not a big research institution. But when I went to NAU and I came here to Arizona, first off, it was my first time to Flagstaff, so I had no idea that even only four hours down the road that there's this little like oasis that that is in the mountains there. I only thought of like Phoenix and Tucson when I when I thought of uh, Arizona. Um, and so I was really impressed when I went to NAU. I got to see other native faculty and native students and I really felt like that was somewhere I could make a difference. Um, rather than going to one of these larger institutions where again I felt would be more of that token uh, native individual. And so now, since I've been at NAU, I was the former uh, co-chair for the Native Research Network. That was a three year I sat on that. I completed a certificate in public health through Johns Hopkins. Um, and then these are the logo for Mita. Um, and the Roots to Wings is a high school program I work with. And then this is my patch here for, for um, uh, the Army Reserves now, because I'm technically based out of Honolulu, so it's real p real hard for me to go down to Hawaii a few times a year. I mean, I, it is hard, so. <laughs> um, but now, so this, again, this path, this journey that I've had has really uh, guided my career goal, right? And the ultimate goal is to improve Native health through research, STEM education, and mentoring. And so again, my research focuses mostly on vaccines using 
um, chemistry and biology tools. And then I also uh, work with a lot of high school programs, which I'll talk about briefly. And this motto over here, uh, this Lakota prayer, really is a driving force, again, behind what I do for, for my research. And that's do this so that the people may live. Because as a native researcher with a bi in biochemistry, there's, v we're, there's very few of us. I only know maybe one or two other native researchers in this area. And so I feel like I should give m back to my community and use my knowledge um, in any way that I can. And again, so this is our, um, the general field of research that I'm in. And so again, when we're talking about more of this biomedical and the vaccines and using chemistry and biology tools, so we use virus-like particles, which are um, what your current HPV vaccines are made out of. We use those as a platform um, to target many, many different diseases. So we target uh, cardiovascular disease. We actually also target um, the methamphetamine addiction. Um, different STIs, cervical cancer, right? Those are all health disparities within tribal communities. Um, again, I'm not sure if you guys have done many gels, but these are just examples of some of the work in our lab. And more the public health side, again, I work with different communities now in both Arizona and um, in the Great Plains, and we look at cervical cancer. So right now we have a project going uh, through Flagstaff, and that's looking at HPV prevalence and also the vaginal microbiome, and that's collecting samples, providing women with surveys. Um, and so this is just an example here. I know you might not be able to read it. And then again with STEM education and mentoring, um, again, we've recently published <coughs> on native identity and how that's important to, to native individuals as they progress through their career. But as far as my, st my st uh, education um, initiatives go, uh, it's really about indigenizing STEM, right? So taking that knowledge um, from our ancestors and bringing it into the classroom so it's not just Western science that they're learning. They're learning that the things that their ancestors knew are things that can be applied today, right? We were the original scientists of the land, and so how can we use that knowledge and bring it back to the, the classroom? And so. Um, I'm founding the, the CARE program, which is a cultural and academic research experience. We are still recruiting, so if you have any um, high school students, we have a virtual and an in-person program um, that we're recruiting for. Happy to talk more about that. Um, and the goal of these, this program is really to create an environment with cultural inclusion, not specifically for Native Americans, but we also include Hispanic um, Asian and Caucasian because they, if they come from low income backgrounds. And again, we provide these students with fundamental tools in chemistry, biology, and health sciences. And again, these are some of my students. Um, this is before the pandemic. This summer will be our first summer back uh, to in person since the pandemic. And here they are again at uh, conferences. And so, again, more recently, I've been involved with the COVID-19 Prevention Network. So this is the network that looked at the phase three clinical trials for all of the COVID-19 vaccines that were approved. So the, the Moderna vaccine, uh, the Johnson & Johnson, while Pfizer wasn't technically under the COVID-19, we did still review and get, receive updates. Um, and I'm also part of many different um, health education initiatives. So that's through the Community Engagement Alliance or, or SEAL, and these are really focused on COVID-19 and how we can um, make sure that those that are most impacted by the pandemic are, are receiving the materials that they need and have the knowledge that they, they are seeking related to the vaccines and, and COVID-19. And so, again, I said I started with family, and that was really the foundation. As an undergrad, I think mentors really helped me get through that next step uh, in my career path. And the motivation and training, right? So that was not only just the military motivating me, getting me on the right path, but having the training as a graduate student as well put me on this path to where I am now. And then as a postdoc at the NIH, I really feel my network um, has helped me just expand my knowledge in all of these different areas in public health and STEM and vaccine research, uh, et cetera. And so, 
And then now, um, in my second postdoc while I was at UNM, I really felt that confidence starting to come back. Um, and you could see it wasn't until I was in my second postdoc where I really felt confident as a scientist, as a person, as who I was um, and what I can bring to the table. And so now, this is me right here screaming ah, out the window as a little kid and my brother who's just like, Naomi, please. <laughs> and so this is where, where I feel like I'm at now where I'm like, ah, I'm just finishing my fourth year. Next year I submit my tenure packet. Uh, research in the pandemic and everything is kind of crazy, but I'm making it through it uh, right now. And so we'll see what happens happens next uh, for me. And so I guess if there's any advice I would like to give to students or others in the audience, it's remember who you are, right? And I always tell my students this, right? If you are a first-gen student, that's fine. Use that as a strength. Remember where you come from. If you come from a more affluent background, remember who you are and that maybe the person sitting next to you is from a different background. Um, and so for me, you know, even though I have all these different titles or hats, you know, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a niece, but I'm also an educator, I'm a mentor, uh, I'm an officer in the Army, and so just remembering who you are and that you don't have to separate those identities as you progress throughout your career. And so always as a pitch, uh, this may not be the most best audience for this, but if you're m interested in switching careers and maybe coming over to biochemistry, um, I have many different uh, areas of uh, at NAU that you can be involved, from high school students all the way up to graduate students. Um, so with that, I would like to say nyawe, as we say in our language, or thank you. And these are current members of my lab. This is most of my lab. We're very female-dominated <laughs> lab. Um, some of my mentors at NAU and then my collaborators at UNM. And so with that, I will be happy to take any questions. So I'm going to repeat your question so they can hear you online. And basically, it was asking about my reserve duties in Hawaii and having those individuals involved in STEM. Um, and so that's exactly what my job is, actually. So when I go to Hawaii, uh, I have friends that are at the University of Hawaii, but it's also networking with the local communities in Hawaii as well and getting them involved in any different way. We have a current NIH grant right now with Palau, and so that will include a cultural immersion, immersion program where we'll take native students down to Palau and they'll spend a summer doing research and we hope to then bring Palauan students back to the state. So what I do here at the at NAU is basically my military job, so I love what I do now. Uh, okay, so the question is, how did I get into research for vaccines, and then how the methamphetamine uh, vaccine works? So when I was at NIH for my first postdoc, I went from more the basic science to the health sciences. And so there I was working on antivirals against different viruses that affect the nervous system. But it wasn't quite what I wanted to do. So when I went to the University of New Mexico, that was a strictly vaccine research. So that was with Bryce Chikurian, who actually worked on one of the um, earlier HPV vaccines. And so there I got to get involved um, with vaccine research. And so for the methamphetamine vaccine, what we're using is, and I can go back. Um, so this slide kind of represents a little bit of what we're doing. So we're using virus-like particles. They're, think of it as a shell, right? It's, a, it's just a delivery system. And we're coating it with methamphetamine molecules all over the surface. And so right now, that's what my current student is doing. She's trying to show that she can do this unique chemistry, put them all over the surface. Um, and we haven't started animal studies yet. Um, so we hope to do that in the next year or so. But there's a lot of questions we don't know 
Um, how this will uh, work in humans, obviously, quite different. That's much farther down the road. Okay, so the question was related to mentoring and attributes that I look for in mentors, but also would um, recommend to other students, right? And so for me, now as a more senior um, person, I have lots of mentors, right? I have mentors uh, within my department. I have mentors that are still, Dr. Yonker is still a mentor of mine. And so uh, my mentors, while many of them are native, I don't, always look for native mentors. I look for those that are in the field. Those that are willing to give me constructive criticism on my research is really important. So I have one mentor, he's very harsh, but I appreciate <laughs> that. Um, I then also have other mentors who are much nicer and you know, they help fluff me when I'm having a down day, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but as far as my, my students, when I am recruiting students to my lab, I tell students about what I have as my own qualities. So I am not a micromanager. I tell students, if you need that type of mentoring where you have to have somebody on you at all times, you should know that now, but know that I won't provide that to you. Um, and again, students, uh, when they're reaching out to me about finding other mentors, whether I will be their mentor or others, I say just make sure those personalities mesh, right? They don't have to be identical, but those personalities mesh, and that that mentor is promoting you and helping you get to your next step, right? Because I, my students in my lab right now, I don't want them to leave because they're doing great things, and I'm one of them's defending tomorrow, and I'm like, oh, if she fails, I can keep her, right? <laughs> um, but really, it comes down to personality and making sure that they're trying to get you to the that next step. Right, so the question was, how did I navigate not having a really supportive advisor? And so I think having those other mentors, even though they weren't my advisors, they were still like encouraging me. They're like, no, you need to stick with this. You need to get through these things. Um, and that's what I tell my current students now who are going off to PhD programs. They're like, are you sure there's a, an advisor there that somebody that you think you could work with and will help promote you because I know what it's like to not have that support. Um, and I think my own personality was a driving factor. Right? I wanted to honor my parents when I came back from my two years off and I was more focused and dedicated. I was like, okay, I need to finish this degree so I can honor my parents even though they're not here. They can see that I have done what I said I was gonna do and go on and do great and better things. And so again, part of that navigation, if you don't have a supportive advisor, is having that own self-motivation and then others around you that can help pick you up when, when you're having a downtime. Yeah, so we have different mechanisms that allow for students to come to NAU um, to do summer research. It's A lot of it is that networking, so reaching out to faculty that you're interested in, seeing if there's support through that research lab or if there's a program on campus as well. And so again, I didn't really learn to network well until I was a postdoc, and so that's so important now. Um, as younger <coughs> students to learn how to network and, and to be willing to put yourself out there. <laughs> yeah, we always like, you know, good labor, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Other questions?
I don't know if there's any from online. <laughs> right. Thank you. Again, this is the best place I've ever been, and so now I'll have to set this as a precedent. <laughs>